Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we have the first part of a four-part series on ceramic inlay and onlay. And I'm going to start with part one, which is the clean-out step and the considerations for when we would onlay versus when we would just continue with perhaps a direct composite. So as in the past, we have Extract a tooth that I've mounted in an Acadental Typodont, and I'm going to start with a 330 carbide and start the outline, which is going to be an MOL based on the caries findings in the tooth. But we don't know how deep and we don't know how wide things are going to be at this point. And typically in a case like this, I would be thinking that a direct composite would be a very acceptable, appropriate restoration. And we might even be able to spare that oblique ridge if possible, but in this particular case, I went ahead and crossed it so you can see what the outline form might look like if we cross the oblique ridge. Now here on the mesial, there's a lot of caries that I had placed in there and it's just sort of falling apart on us. So uh, it can be a little bit unnerving when this happens when you're working clinically, but just try to stick to the outline form as conservative as you can uh, sometimes the walls are very soft and crumbly and they'll uh, widen almost without pushing the burr at all. Uh, but that's just the way it goes in the clinical world. You know, I made this artificial caries with a combination of turmeric, cayenne pepper, and flowable composite. And it looks really real. It's kind of cool. And you can see here that there's caries on the mesial. Uh, we have uh, no caries on the distal. We have caries lesion on the lingual and the lingual uh, fissure area there. And we're obviously going to need to drop a mesial box. The goal of our outline form is to get a clean DEJ plus an additional 0.5 millimeters beyond the DEJ when possible or even more. And uh, we're just going to move the burr in the fissure and drop down into the carious area here with the idea that we want to go into dentin slightly and make sure that the walls on the mesial and distal and gingival are caries free. We don't really want to worry about the caries on the pulpal or axial wall. We want to focus our attention on the caries on the peripheral areas, which is really hard to do because once you encounter caries, uh, we we kind of get excited. It's, this is something I can remove. This is the reason why I'm doing this in the first place. But you have to have some discipline to keep yourself from moving into those deep spots. Uh, remember, step one of GV Black's preparations is to obtain your outline form, and the outline form should be caries free. Now we're, we're dropping our box, and we're going to use a 245 and drop the box. And you can see how thin that enamel shell is, plus it's caries all the way through to that composite. We're going to go ahead and keep the burr away from the adjacent composite so that we don't damage it. We're just going to move the burr buckle lingually and just casually move it down a little bit more gingerly until the little piece breaks off. Uh, we can refine the box a little bit even though this is not an amalgam. It's nice to use some hand instruments. Here I'm using an off-angle chisel just to remove loose enamel rods and even to create, even if you wanted to, a little bit of a flare. Uh, we're going to do the same thing over here on the, the facial side using the sharp end of the instrument. You know, the, the cutting edge is going to be up against that area and the bevel will be facing away from the wall. And we're just trying to remove a little bit of loose enamel rods so we can get a preparation that looks a little bit cleaner in the box area. So now we're ready for our round burr. And I'm going to utilize a number four round burr. We could have picked up a six round burr or an eight round burr, but the key is to think big. So we just work peripherally around the lesion and then work ourselves down into the center of it, but being careful not to push too hard and checking with the explorer to see if there's any sticky spots. If you scrape the explorer across the caries and it leaves a little dusty powder while you're scraping it, that's a little bit too soft. I like to get it to the point where while you scrape it, it feels like you're scraping up against something glass, glassy. So when you see it scraping up little pieces of caries like that, you know you have a little bit more to go. 
We also have a lesion on the mesial at the axial pulpal area and we're going to do this in the same way we've done this area on the on the pulpal area. Slow speed is critical or electric hand piece that's dialed down very slow like 500 maybe to a thousand RPM. The key is that you want to feel what you're doing. You want to get a sense of the hardness of the surface and how easily the round burr sinks into the tooth structure. If you're to scrape across this mesial, if you see those little chips coming out, that is an indication that caries is still remaining. Now, you could leave that caries, and we know from numerous studies that leaving caries in that, at that level uh, can be arrested quite nicely. But I went ahead and just removed a little bit more just to demonstrate uh, the caries removal process a little bit more aggressively. You can do it either way. Now sometimes you can even use a carbide burr in a slow speed to extend into a deeper fissure like we're doing here on the lingual or you can switch to a smaller round burr because a four round burr would not fit in this area. So perhaps a two round or a one round burr could be used. But I'm just using the 330 burr because uh, it is a shape that I already had nearby and it works really well for us. So you can then go ahead now and, and, and push the Explorer against these areas and it's as glassy hard as you would have on the adjacent dentin areas. And it's important to verify that the DEJ is completely clean all the way around. Look up underneath the cusps, uh, look at the DEJ in all locations. Studies have shown that uh, the most common area to leave caries behind is underneath cusps and that was determined whether you were a student or a faculty member. So it's an area that I think we're all challenged by. The RGS-1-2 is used to see if your extensions are okay, check your depth, make sure that your adequate depth, uh, this is a composite, so we could be a little less than 1.5, but I made it 1.5 for the demo. This is an RGS-2 and it measures two millimeters in, in length and you can see that we're probably 2.5 to three millimeters deep in that deepest area of the carious lesion, which is quite a distance away from the pulp and we're not overly concerned about that. But it's important, I think, to look at the radiograph and make sure that this doesn't have a large pulp horn. At this point, uh, the caries is uh, hard. It's, a, it's easily arrested uh, with uh, the appropriate restorative procedures. And I'm going to utilize a resin-modified glass ionomer liner. So this uh, little system here can be dispensed by clicking the little lever on the back and you get uh, both the base and the catalyst. I always like to make sure I recap this so that the material stays uncured. And we'll scoop up a little piece here and you can either use a little dical calcium hydroxide type mixing applicator and, or a Bertels applicator, which is uh, my preferred uh, method. Today I'm using a small little uh, plastic instrument that could be used for composites for this purpose. And we can usually keep it a little bit neater and not let it flop all over the, the finish line and the margins like this. But I was a little sloppy uh, and uh, I'm going to show you how we would clean this up, which is good to know how to do. So I can take the Explorer now and, and sort of push it over into the areas that it needs to go, make sure that it's flowing well. And we're going to go back at this uh, after we like cure this and we're going to smooth it out. The light cure for this product is 20 seconds. So let's make sure you cure it the full 20 seconds with the tip touching the tooth. And now you can see that the, the liner is all up against the cable surface margin. This is completely unacceptable. We need to remove all of that. And very easy to do, uh, just place the 330 burr or the uh, 330 RGS, something like that, and uh, just run the burr along those walls and the the base comes off quite easily if we were a little bit more careful about placing the base we wouldn't have to do this and this is when you could even start you know maybe smoothing off that little s curve transition doing a little bit of smoothing of the pulpa wall and all the walls of the preparation so i think that at this point you could restore this with composite i mean it's pretty straightforward so i don't think we need to talk about that but I want to transform this tooth into something different. In other words, a simulated tooth that would clearly be indicated for an onlay. 
So now you see quite a different situation. Class 6 erosive areas on the occlusal due to wear and exposed dentin, a crack on the distal, a wider isthmus. The only indications, there are several, and I'll just discuss a few of them. The patient desires a tooth colored restoration, in other words, no gold. They have occlusal wear, like in this case, a structural compromise where you're missing a lot of tooth structure, or cracks, either they're visible or there's some pain on biting. We can just sort of imagine that this patient might have had pain on biting on that distal lingual cusp, perhaps, and that this would clearly indicate an onlay. So in the next part of this series, this four-part series, we are going to show you the MOD onlay preparation on this situation. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned.